in this multi-part Nonsense Wars production, I will show designing and building a Pennsylvania Railroad oil electric motor car from start to finish. I talked a little bit about my process before, such as in the H1044 or the CP business car videos, but only piecemeal rather than end to end. For this model, I screen captured the entire design process, which proved a little tedious since I usually don't work in long sessions and had to constantly stop and start the recording. Even before getting into CAD, I need to do a little research on the prototype, a PRR OEG 415. I want to find a good scale drawing and some good reference pictures. Oftentimes I find images of a model better than images of the real thing, as the former tends to have more pictures from more angles. If I can't find an adequate amount of source material, I usually won't proceed with a build until I can. Uh, this happened with both of the D2 tank engines. With the drawing in hand, I know the size of the prototype, the size of Lego bricks, and the scale I want to use, uh, 1 to 48, so I can calculate the size of the model. I can therefore fit the drawing to a grid of plates and figure out where to put things and how big to make them. I want to see what might be difficult or impossible to model before getting stuck much later. Nothing really caught my eye for the OEG 415, largely due to its simple shape. Now I can finally open up LDD and sketch out the key dimensions in brick the length, the width, the height, and the bogey spacing and placement. Here I already have to make a compromise. The small train wheels have a larger diameter than the actual wheels, uh, largely because of the flanges, and the really small wheels won't work either. Instead, I space the axles further apart than prototypical, to try to achieve the right look. I do a little bit of more detailed design on the body to see if I can build the sides the same way as the P54 sides. This seems reasonable and the 1x2x2 windows line up pretty well with the actual windows. My usual steam locomotive roof outline also lines up pretty well with the actual roof outline. At this stage, I go back and forth between the drawing and the CAD pretty often, but I do this less as more features get set. With the overall dimensions established, I investigate implementing an experimental feature. Uh, some model trains have flywheels that smooth out acceleration and running, and I wanted to try something similar in LEGO. The large volume and low performance, uh, only one driven bogey, of the OEG 415 make it the perfect candidate to house a sufficiently large flywheel and the require transmission components. At first, it looked like the flywheels themselves wouldn't fit beneath a roof made with the older 2x3 curved slopes, but the newer 1x2 curved slopes saved the day. I would unfortunately need a ton of these for the rest of the model as well. Once I knew that the drivetrain would fit, I had to see if it would actually work. 
I built a test bed with the proper dimensions and I ran it with and without the flywheel. It didn't make the acceleration realistic per se, but it did smooth it out enough for me to continue with the experiment. Note that I used the ungeared 9 volt motor in order to spin the flywheel up to useful speeds without adding even more gearing. I tried to add more rotational mass, but the test bed couldn't handle it, and I intended to revisit once I designed more structure. Next, I work on flattening the gearbox to fit under the roof as well. I waver between 1 to 9 and 1 to 5 gearing, but the former won out after a bit more testing. 1 to 5 needs too much torque, making it harder to spin up and decreasing the effectiveness of the flywheel. I felt comfortable with the performance of the 1 to 9 drivetrain, having previously used a similar one in the GE U30B. I also want to minimize the amount of friction in the transmission, and I try to do this by reducing the number of gear stages and therefore the amount of rubbing on gear teeth and bearing surfaces. I brought the gear count down from six in the prototype gearbox to four in the final layout, though mounting the snot frame would prove annoying to build around going forward. Then I take a look at the two ends, which have these slightly sloped surfaces on the sides. I didn't know if I wanted to model this feature or keep the nose more flat. At the very least, I didn't want to slope the sides with clips uh, the way I did them on the P54s. Eventually, I sloped them with hinge plates uh, the way I did them on the leader. This does require pushing the faces out by half a plate, which I did using a ton of headlight bricks. This model suffers from what I call the corner problem, where a prototype has two windows that meet at a corner. Lego neither has the parts nor the resolution to model this well. Uh, barring some complicated assembly, one side usually ends up with too much wall, and I just have to pick which side. I decide to stretch the side view since I already decided to extend the bogies and hinge the slope sides. Despite the flywheel experiment, I want the model to work with train motors since most people probably would not run the flywheel drivetrain. The extra plate of height on the train motors makes accommodating them difficult because that extra plate needs to rotate very far when the model navigates R40 turns. I need to thin the walls around the bogey in order to make it work. I do this for the R50B as well, and I eventually settled on these inverted panels. Those panels prove quite challenging to mount. I have to work around the aforementioned gearbox mounts and the nearby recessed sliding door. I pay close attention to the structural integrity of this area, uh, making sure enough plates can bridge the gap between the front and the middle sections of the model. I ultimately don't work out the actual implementation at this point, 
that will have to wait until the next pass. I then address some smaller features and greebles. The end roofs, the passenger doors, and the rear steps. I try to fix the final position of the electronics and discover that I need to use many more 1x2 curves to clear the battery box. Despite what I said earlier about further flywheel testing, the structural considerations around the transmission ultimately prohibit increasing the size to more than five wheels. Finally, I do the bogey frames very similarly to many I have done in the past. I generally prefer the sturdiness of bricks over the thinness of rods. I have to make them eight wide to clear the six length axles supporting the driving wheels. I don't like supporting these official wheels with five length axles. My earlier decision to stretch the bogies also lets me use these older arches for both the front and rear frames. So that pretty much wraps up part one of this series, which covers about six hours of CAD and another hour or two of physical prototyping. At this point, I know how I want to build most of the external features, and the next part will show how I connect it all together. On that note, this is the end of the video. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too long or too tedious. Uh, please consider subscribing if you like what we do, and have a nice day.